Welcome everybody to another session of Qualify, our student-led training and um, learning initiative where we're trying to connect researchers and faculty members interested in all forms of qualitative and fieldwork research. Um, today's session is on the use of uh, focus groups in political science research, and we are very happy to be joined by Dr. Leon Stanley from um, Sheffield University. Uh, before we start, though, a couple of housekeeping announcements. Uh, first of all, the session will be recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel later on. So should you prefer not to be recorded, just switch off your camera uh, and you can communicate with us via the chat function. And then next Tuesday, the 11th of May, we are finally launching our EUI Ethnography Club. Um, we'll be discussing the ethnography of Palestinian refugees um, in Lebanon by Luigi Akili. So please do let me know if you'd like to attend and I'll provide you with more uh, details. For those of you who have already registered, I will be sending an email about um, with a place and time exactly uh, this afternoon. Then uh, next session of uh, Qualify of our working group will be on the 21st of May, which is I think in two or three weeks. And we will... Um, and we'll be joined by Dr. Agnieszka Pasieka from the University of Vienna, who will give us a talk um, on encountering adversarial opinions in the fieldwork research. Uh, Dr. Pasieka is currently um, conducting research on grassroots, far-right political networks in Poland, Hungary, and Italy. So I think this is sure to be an interesting um, session. And uh, moving on to moving on to the, today's session to discuss the use of focus groups in political research, we are joined by uh, Dr. Liam Stanley from Sheffield University. Um, Dr. Stanley is a lecturer in political uh, in politics and an associate fellow at the Sheffield Ec Political Economy Research Institute. His research is centered on developing innovative methods and approaches to make sense of how the world has changed since the 2008 global financial crisis. He's currently working on uh, three research projects uh, after ne neoliberalism, austerity, life and death in a post-crisis world, uh, public attitudes towards the undeser undeserving rich, and reimagining tax through speculative designs. Dr. Stanley has held building uh, fellowships at the University of Amsterdam, our own European University Institute, and Copenhagen Business School. Um, so Dr. Stanley will give us a short presentation on how, to, how he utilizes the focus groups in, uh, in his own uh, research, uh, after which we'll open the floor for, for debate and discussion. So uh, just raise your digital hand uh, uh, if you'd like to ask a question, and uh, we're gonna proceed this way. And now, without further ado, um, Liam, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And hi, everyone. It's, a, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, thanks, thanks so much for inviting me along to this uh, fantastic scheme you've, you've um, started up here. I would very much would have liked something like this when I was a PhD student. So I'm very, very happy to be, to be a part of it. I guess I should say, just as a quick warning before I start, um, discussing this before the session started, but I received my, I was fortunate enough to receive my second dose of the Pfizer vaccine yesterday, which is obviously very good. Um, but it does mean that I'm, I'm not quite feeling at my sharpest today. I'm not sure if anyone else had a vaccine yet and felt the same. I kind of feel a bit jet lagged. So um, obviously I feel well enough to, to, do, to, do the, to do the session, but yeah, I may not be at my sharpest, which, which I apologize if so. So I've been asked to talk about um, my experience of, of doing focus groups and to reflect on the kind of methodological and practical issues with, with doing them. I thought what I, since this is a series of sessions about the use of qualitative methods, what I thought I'd focus on in particular is, I guess, uh, for, for a less kind of like highfalutin term, the kind of journey that I went on in trying to work out how to use qualitative methods in a way that I found rigorous and, and relevant. Uh, I think that it, I found it extremely challenging to try and connect to the kind of literatures and the academic debates I was using, I wanted to contribute to whilst using a method like this. And yeah, I went through a lot of difficulties in, in trying to overcome that. And a lot of it I found out was to do with nothing to the method itself, but rather the way in which our kind of methodological knowledge is organized and the way in which we're socialized and thinking about research methods. And so a big lesson for me, which I'm going to try and discuss today, is trying to kind of de almost like denaturalize our own thinking about methods and data and how we can use them in a more qualitative way. So that means I'll probably talk a little bit less about like the actual practical side of, of focus groups. Um, 
but I'm also very, very, if anyone would like me, if anyone would like to know how I recruited participants and how I analyzed the data and that kind of thing, I'm also very happy to talk about that. Um, I should also not haven't got any slides or anything. I'm just gonna kind of, I've got some notes, but I'm, I'm just gonna kind of talk and, and hope that it just works out. And so I thought that maybe I could start by just giving a quick overview about kind of the, the experience I've got and where I'm getting on what my experiences are because that might be that might be relevant to understanding where I'm coming from on this. So um, I've used focus groups in, in two major research projects and um, that's where my experience comes from. The first project I did was my PhD which I started uh, 11 years ago quite freakishly and the second project was a recent collaboration I did with a campaigning group and I'll just say a little bit about them. So uh, my PhD, which I started in 2010, was centred on um, the political economy of Britain. And the thing that really interested me, thinking back to 2010, uh, was that shift that I'm sure everyone's aware of, of uh, the global financial crisis. Suddenly we, we went from living in a global financial crisis to suddenly living in a world of austerity. And that was very much the case in, in the UK. Now, the thing that really interested me about that is that in the UK, unlike I think in other places, there was in a, quite, in a way that I found quite strange, there was surprising amounts of public support for austerity measures. Um, and a lot of people who observed this said it's because uh, the Conservative government who got voted in on the basis of restoring fiscal responsibility after years of labor overspending, kind of told a very compelling story about how the UK is gonna end up like Greece if it doesn't like tighten its belt. Um, and this seemed like a very persuasive kind of narrative that managed to convince lots of people. And so that's kind of what I thought would be an interesting thing to study. It's like, well, how and why, if this story is meant to be so persuasive, like how and why does that work exactly? Like, well, that just seems like an interesting thing. Like, why would, why would so many people think that something that seems so self-evidently damaging to so many experts would be a good idea? And that was kind of ends up being my research question. Why do so many people think austerity was a good idea? And obviously thinking about how you study that, my initial kind of, I guess my initial thought would be to do like surveys. Um, but thinking about that, is it just seems, and again, if this sounds simple, it's because it kind of was simple. It just seems like the best way, the best thing to do is just to ask people about it and see what they thought. Um, so that's what I did. And I thought, because, because I was interested in kind of as a political phenomenon, um, I was less interested in people's individual opinions on this topic because, you know, everyone has all sorts of different opinions about the economy and policy and politics. Whilst it, I was interested rather in like how and why the story works, why that austerity story worked and how people would make sense and interact with it. And that's why focus groups, therefore, became a really obvious method, because as you would have seen, the, the main virtue of focus groups is that they're able to access kind of like collective meaning making in a way that I think almost no other methods perhaps can in, in, in the same way. Uh, so for my PhD research, I'm not sure what it's like um, in EUI. I imagine it's not quite like this, but my budget for my entire PhD research was a thousand pounds. So that's like about a thousand euros. Um, I don't know, it didn't feel like a lot of the time. And basically I had to spend almost that entire budget on um, participant incentives. So basically I'm like paying participants to, to come along, um, which meant that I had to do all the research myself. So I had to recruit all the participants, had to organize all the locations, had to moderate them myself, had to transcribe, analyze all the data. Um, and some of those organizational bits, which, you know, if you want me to talk more about them, I'd have to do were, were horrible and a nightmare. Um, but the moderating, myself was absolutely brilliant. I absolutely loved it. It was one of the best experiences I've had as an academic. Um, and the data that I got from it um, was, at, was, well, for me, it was, it was superb. I hope others, I hope others might agree. Um, and so in the, end of, in the end, I did 40, I, did, I had 40 participants across eight groups, I think. And I used a couple of different recruitment methods. Some I did kind of like almost, a sort of qualitative equivalent of systematic sampling and but I also use snowball sampling to try and access some different groups so that was my PhD research and I was immensely happy with that the data was incredibly rich and um, 
yeah, it, I've spent basically like the last, I haven't been working with that data for many years now, but the insights that I got from it have basically given me like a decade's worth of work, which has been fantastic. Um, so then the second project I've been working on is very, very different. And that's why I thought it might be interesting to kind of bring it up and discuss it. Um, the second project I've been doing in the last couple of years has been a collaboration uh, with a campaigning group in the UK called um, Tax Justice UK. And they are basically interested in trying to change the public conversation public conversation and public debate here in the UK uh, to try and swing things towards introducing new or more uh, wealth taxes, which is obviously a big agenda, especially now um, post COVID. And so this ended up being a very, very different project. And it's very interesting to have this experience as well as my initial one, because this one we had uh, a much, much bigger budget. I'm not actually sure what it was, but it was 10, 20, or possibly 30 times more than my PhD research budget. Uh, it was driven by the campaigning group, so I had a lot less uh, control over it, which had pros and cons. Pros being that I didn't have to find all the people myself. Uh, the cons being you have less control. So uh, obviously the campaigning group wanted lots of input on the types of questions. There was a professional moderator who was um, very extremely good, but did things in a slightly different way for me. Um, and so I'm less happy with the data from that um, for those reasons, but it's still very, very good. Um, and yeah, it's been really interesting to contrast those two experiences. So again, I'll know, if, if you want to know more about the practical side, I'd be happy to talk about more about that. Um, but the reason why I say that is the reason why I introduced these two projects is because what ties these two projects together, and I think where my interest is in focus groups uh, methodologically, is that I'm interested in using them to uh, research kind of the public or public opinion. That's kind of what I find interesting about them. Um, but that's also where the most challenging way to use them as well, as, as, as I think we'll find out. I think I'm interested in basically doing like qualitative public opinion in, in some sense. Um, and I guess the reason why it's important to say that is because that's kind of how I, that's how I, uh, that's my, I guess my experience with focus groups, but it's important to note that's not the only way to do them. So, you know, if you look in the wider literature, you'll find people who do focus groups with, say, policymakers or kind of elites, if you want to use that terminology. Uh, more commonly, you'll find uh, focus groups being um, conducted with a much more specific kind of target group. So, for example, yesterday I was reading um, a project that was looking at the lived experiences of being in the British military, for example. And obviously, the kind of that's nothing to do with public opinion, it's to do with just the lived, what, what's it like to be in the military and the kind of politics of that. But yeah, the way, the way I'm thinking about it is much more that public opinion and politics way, so that might be worth just keeping, keeping in mind. So the big realisation that I had when I was doing this, the initial research, which was then the motivation for writing that article that I think has been set alongside this seminar, was that even though I wanted to use uh, qualitative methods to study public opinion, I realized that it is impossible to study public opinion using qualitative methods. It's impossible. Now that might seem like a slightly odd thing to argue at like a qualitative method seminar whose purpose it is to uh, promote uh, the use of um, qualitative methods. So let me, let me qualify what I'm saying. It's not because uh, quantitative methods are better um, or that qualitative methods are deficient. That's not why I say that. The reason why I say that is because public opinion is, I think, um, an inherently quantitative concept. And indeed, almost all of our methodological concepts, I think, are set up in favour and work for quantitative and positivist work rather than interpretivist and qualitative work. So I have no idea how uh how obvious this is it, it seems obvious to me now because i've kind of gone because it's something i've spent a lot of time thinking about but i found this extremely difficult to comprehend it's one thing to talk the talk on it it's another thing to walk the walk on it and the reason for that is because i was socialized through my phd methods training and through all of my degrees to to approach data to approach um methods in an implicitly positivist way 
which I found kind of like organized out um, certain forms of interpretive qualitative research, which meant that, which yeah, I found very, very challenging. So even once I acknowledged that, I still found it probably another year or two before I could actually overcome that in, in, in practice. So that's kind of what I mean when I say it's impossible to study public opinion using qualitative methods. Um, it's impossible because qualitative methods can't do that. You can only, I think you can only study quantitative uh, public opinion using quantitative, quantitative methods. And so while that might appear like a slightly arcane thing to say, um, well, I think this is kind of an interesting thing to think about because it kind of reflects fundamental methodological differences. Uh, and I think that what, one of the things I was trying to do in that article, and I'm not sure how subtle or explicit this was, I can't quite remember, I couldn't bring myself to look at it again, um, is that uh, the predominance of quantitative methods is common sense, not just in academia and methods training, but to some extent also kind of in the public sphere, in as much the public, in the case of public opinion, uh, it needs to be challenged um, if, we're, if good qualitative research can be done, I think. Um, and I'll obviously I'll discuss this in relation to focus groups, but I think it has some application outside of it. So what I'll do is I'll just say a little bit about the kinds of things I found useful in trying to challenge this quantitative um, mindset I found myself trapped in. So I guess the first thing to say is a little bit about focus groups. Um, so as we probably know, focus groups, they have their unique selling point is that they are able to produce data on how a small group of people discuss, make sense of, and tell stories about certain political issues. If we wanted to put that into more kind of like fancy terms, I think we could say something like collective meaning making um, and that sort of thing. And so the key, one of the key bits is the interaction between people and the, the way in which people will discuss things that are different because of the presence of, of other people. I mean, that's socially obvious. <laughs> um, and so it's not difficult to then take that as a methodological principle and apply it and think about what one is accessing in, in, in that respect. So the results, I think, can therefore be very rich and really helpful in understanding the kind of worlds in which we and other people and our research participants uh, inhabit. Uh, but the methodological trade-off is obvious which is you get rich, unique data, but it's very difficult to scale up, which is the term that I kind of fall back on, scale up that data from its kind of like immediate kind of milieu in which it's collected to something wider. Um, because we always want to scale up in some way, um, I think, I think. So this sometimes, so I, obviously I get asked to review quite a lot of focus group research for different journals. And one of, you know, one of, the, one of my kind of like bugbears is when someone will say in a focus group article that, um, oh, you know, we interviewed 40 people, let's say, and, but because we're using qualitative methods, obviously we can't make any claims above, beyond those 40 people. But all they always do, because otherwise the article would have to be, this article reports on what 40 people think. And no one is interested really in what 40 people think. What we're interested in is why those four, the way in which those 40 people think and interact and discuss is somehow reflective of something broader that we can make conclusions about. So I always find it kind of like, obviously it's not like a red line or anything, but it's always something that I want to try and push on and say, well, we need to kind of be honest and think about methodologically what we're actually doing here so we can use the method as, as, as best we can. So how on earth do we generalize from a discussion of say 40 people across eight discussions to something more meaningful, rigorous and robust to do with something, at least in my case, was to do with public opinion. Very, very difficult. Um, and this is, I guess this is, this is where I'm coming from when I say it's impossible to study public opinion from, from this perspective, because um, if we take a public opinion approach to these questions I'm asking, it's impossible because, uh, Qualitative research to study kind of like what the public thinks will always be destined to fail when it's asked to fit in with the values that we're used to thinking about. So for example, you know, this will be obvious to us all, but just for what it's worth, you know, a representative sample is by definition a statistical term, isn't it? 
Uh, and that, of course, that's an essential component for any quantitative method studying uh, public opinion, because by aggregating individual preferences and beliefs from a systematically random sample, we can then sort of extrapolate onto a wider population and therefore say something meaningful and rigorous about the public. And although this is obviously quite technically difficult to achieve, or it can be, it is like a, it's philosophically uncontroversial to do that. Everyone accepts that that's, that's a legitimate thing. The problem is, of course, that qualitative research cannot, will not, and will never fit with those, with those values. If you are interviewing 40 people in a specific locale, like I've done, a representative sample is impossible. So, but that's not to say that they're not valuable. We just need to find a different way to, to make them valuable and to, and, and to make them work. But the problem is, is that the assumptions and value systems of quantitative methods and of positivism double up as the implicit assumptions and value systems for social science as a whole. Qualitative research will never live up to these values, and so it's destined to fail. What we need to do and what I needed to do and what I found very useful, but also very difficult, was therefore to develop like an alternative vocabulary, or not develop one, just take one for the, because there's many out there, uh, that, will, that allowed me in this case, and will hopefully will allow people to use qualitative methods, including focus groups, to study something like public opinion. What this means is that we need qualitative concepts and methodology to go with the qualitative methods. And what I found in my PhD training is that often got encouraged to do qualitative methods, but they were still being underpinned by an implicit quantitative or more accurately positivist quantitative methodology, which made it very difficult. So reading lots of the literature on qualitative methods and focus groups, there was three things that I found really useful as like a way of trying to get out this mindset. Um, and they are thinking about the unit of analysis, uh, thinking about sampling and thinking about scaling up. And so I'll just say a little bit, a little bit about them. So in terms of the unit analysis, the unit analysis in kind of like positivist quantitative methods is almost always the individual, always. And in particular, it's the individual's beliefs and their attitudes as sort of accessed or expressed through survey questions, or it might be their behavior recorded through voting or, or whatever it is. And of course, with, there's an assumption that uh, within that, that the true beliefs and attitudes of an individual are accessible somehow to the researcher. Obviously, there's a lot of controversy about that, but that's still the underlying philosophical principle. Um, otherwise, there wouldn't be so much, um, you know, worry about potentially biased or misleading questions and, and so on and so on. So already there's this, there's this assumption in positivist quantitative research the, what we want to do, and this is, I'm kind of stealing this from um, Cavale interviews, which is a brilliant book, is um, they, he discusses it in terms of trying to distinguish between the unit of analysis of, he, how do you put it, he puts it in terms of mining versus journeying. So mining is the idea that what you want to access as a researcher kind of like already exists inside um, you know a person's mind or whatever and the idea of the method is to kind of like excavate that and like preserve it with as little like bias or interference as possible and to like get it out there and that that's obviously a really important way way of doing it but most of the time I think in qualitative research that doesn't really make as much sense especially when it comes to focus groups, because we're not interested, our unit of analysis is not an individual unit of analysis. Rather, the unit of analysis for focus groups is something social and collective. It's typically something to do with, you know, the social constitutions of the world that we inhabit and make. And so in concrete terms, this might mean that unit of analysis might be people's experiences, the kinds of shared narratives that people with similar experiences will tell and the process in which people's identities and connections with one another are kind of like made or remade and, and can be contested sometimes. And I think these are all phenomena that cannot be captured very well through uh, uh, quantitative surveys to kind of use my um, uh, slightly straw man um, example. So unit analysis is a really important thing to think about though. Focus groups only really work when the unit analysis is collective rather than individual. And this kind of become, well, I'll say a bit more about this in my second point. So my second move that I found uh, very challenging to kind of unlearn it was um, sampling. 
So theories and practices of sampling are, are less established in qualitative methods than they are in quantitative methods. There is a lot of very good stuff out there, but, and again, hopefully this is why this kind of session is very good and why I wish I had it, is that it took me a long time to know that it was out there. And I didn't find the kind of introductions to it as well presented or as intuitive as I did for, for quantitative methods. And so, yeah, I guess the main lesson I took here is that representative sampling cannot work in uh, focus group research or qualitative work, it, it cannot. And it, if anything, it can actually end up being like offensive, unethical and poor practice. And so this is the kind of things that obviously I've advised a lot of people on focus groups. And so, you know, a lot of the kind of things that will come out from these discussions is, oh, you know, should we make sure that, for example, each of our focus groups contain, say, uh, a representative breakdown of the racial breakdown, uh, the, the, racial, um, the racial stratification of the group that you're interested in, in studying. And the problem with that is then if just say you've got group focus groups of eight people and just say the stratification that you're interested in is roughly like 10% of one, one ethnicity or race, you can see why this leads to problems because then you, what you're doing is you're kind of then trying to look for what in effect is like a representative of, of that particular uh, social identity to come in and effectively be the representative in, in the group which raises all sorts of methodological issues that I think are incorrect. So when it comes to, and it goes back to the individual versus the collective. Again, the whole point of focus groups is not interested in what the individuals think, we're interested in the collective. So that means, and again, the Bryman reading that I think was set alongside this is very good on this, that one needs to pick a, a kind of, a, some sort of preformed collective that already exists where people already have some sort of shared experience and then sample on the basis of that and this is often referred to in the literature i'm sure many many of you have seen it as as theoretical sampling so what this means is instead of sampling for individual characteristics what you sample for instead is uh, a, at least in, in my case was a kind of similar type of lived experience so that what you want to get what you can therefore say is you can then say this group is um not representative in a statistical sense, but representative in a qualitative sense of a particular way of living or a particular type of experience. And we can say that if we've done, say, four focus groups with, in my case, it was uh, middle, middle income homeowners in suburban areas who I thought were a particularly important electoral constituency, especially for my study. We can say that if we do four groups, um, four focus groups with uh, people of that particular experience, and in those four groups, we see almost exactly the same patterns in terms of the way in which people uh, negotiate the questions, the kind of stories people tell, the kind of identities that people are organizing themselves into. Then we can, we can reasonably expect that if we did four more groups, we'd get, the, we'd get a similar pattern. And so this moves on to the third move, which is like scaling up. Uh, so scaling up in quantitative work is relatively simple, it's a statistical principle. One alternative qualitative way of scaling up, which I found very useful, um, and I can't remember where I, I can't remember off the top of my head where I got this from, but I'm sure I would have cited it in my article, is um, analytical general generality rather than generalizability. So analytical generality. And just to repeat what I just said, so this is the principle that if you have if you've conducted say five focus groups of people who you think theoretically are linked in some way and that you find in those groups everything comes up you get the same patterns and you observe them then you can be reasonably sure that there's some sort of shared phenomena happening that we can then unpick through both not just our analysis of the data but also our theorizing and our conceptualizations that kind of come out of that data analysis and so therefore we can kind of scale up in a slightly different way which is kind of on the basis of almost like a wager. That wager being that uh, if I if I did much more focus groups, I wouldn't find uh, I wouldn't find um, completely different patterns, and that these have a consistent and structural pattern that we that we think we can we can talk about in a way that um, extends just beyond those forty people that we've, that we've interviewed. 
So those are just some three ways of challenging this kind of like quantitative positivist common sense that I myself was socialized into that I found very challenging to, to overcome. And so by using a kind of like qualitative unit of analysis, a sampling strategy and scaling up methods, I think, I hope that I found a way of making rigorous claims that was something like public opinion, um, but perhaps not. Um, and I say not public opinion because as I said, I think public opinion is an inherently quantitative concept. So that's partly why this article that um, was set alongside this was part of a special issue, uh, which we called Everyday Narratives. And so that was kind of the, the motivation behind that was to kind of say, here's a way of sort of, of studying what we might call public opinion, but through a qualitative, through a um, qualitative way. And the whole principle of this is uh, let's, let's analyze how different publics, how different groups tell stories about politics. Um, and this means studying what sort of politics um, those stories justify or contest. Uh, how those idea identities and narratives that underpin those views kind of make and remake uh, the boundaries of legitimate political action. Um, and yeah, I hope, I hope that's useful to some people. Um, I've certainly found it useful for myself. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll, I, could, I could go on talking, but I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. I've talked for quite a while. Uh, I'll, I'll pass that to you, thanks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Liam, for the great, great uh, chat. So let me just give you a little clap here. Um, uh, and yeah, I think uh, I think we can just open open the floor to to any questions or debate. Um, has anyone got any questions um, to Liam for the presentation or with regards to the the reading list? Uh, yeah, Wolfgang, do you want to go first? Yeah, I mean, thanks so much, Liam. Super interesting and actually uh, much more than just to talk about focus groups. Um, <laughs> and I think uh, general themes which uh, kind of we have uh, com coming up in this uh, in the session uh, in this in this working group quite a bit. So um, it definitely fits in very nicely. Thanks a lot. Um, I mean, I literally just actually would have would have asked you to maybe just actually expand a little bit more um, on on just the practical side of, of of your experiences with focus groups on on basically just the setup of 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 of, of these of these discussions of of how as a moderator what best practices of how to to do it as a moderator um, and and yeah how to steer that kind of um, uh, focus groups and stuff like that. So just we, we don't necessarily do it now immediately. Maybe somebody has another question, but I would love to hear some more on that. Um, yeah, Steven, do you, uh, I mean, Liam, do you want to just, just drop a few questions and then answer or the or one by one? How should we do it? I don't know. No, I'm, I'm happy to, I think I'm happy to have to take them one on one if if that's okay. I mean, I think that that's quite a big question. So I could probably, I'll okay, probably well, pick up on now if that's okay. And then maybe we, maybe the others can be in groups. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the practical side of focus groups, how I set them up and um, how I moderated them. So as I said, with these, so with these focus groups, I, the ones I did for my PhD, I, um, I recruited all the participants myself um, and so that was an arduous process. I couldn't, I'll say a little bit about that because what I wanted to, so it all, the, the way I sampled or the way I recruited, I should say, came from those kind of, some of those theoretical and methodological principles I was saying about trying to access some sort of collective experience. So basically what I did is I was interested in speaking to two different types of groups. Um, and I'll talk about the first type, which was um, middle income homeowners, and the reason why I was interested in speaking to them is because it's often said in British politics that they're the ones who are kind of most responsible for, um, they're, the, they're the target audience of um, competing parties and who they want to speak to the most in order to win elections. So I thought it makes sense to speak to them. Um, so the, the way I recruited them is um, I basically picked, I looked at, I did some very basic analysis of looking at like house prices in this case. And on that basis, I identified kind of, I cross-referenced that with different electoral constituencies 
and I basically found I chose maybe like four or five like specific like locations like neighborhoods and I was like okay those are going to be my my areas and then what I did is I in the UK we have an electoral register so what I did is I basically built a data set of everyone within like a mile radius of a particular point in a neighborhood and put them into a data set um, and then I went through and phoned um, each fifth person on that list and invited them to a focus group until I had enough participants <laughs> and that was um, so when I said some of it was awful that bit was genuinely awful because it involved like cold I was basically like cold calling people <laughs> At their homes to try and invite them to my research and it was yeah I found it excruciating um but it was the only it's the only way I could have done it in in with the rigor that I that I wanted um so I invited so yeah I managed to get these people because the the practical challenge of focus groups um is how do you get eight people who I in my case didn't know each other who had no connection to you how do you get them all to go to the same place at the same time for no reason, basically? Um, because why would anyone want to go to a focus group? It's it's really difficult. Um, so in that, the ob one obvious answer to that is you have you you pay people to participate, and that's where, as I said, most of my most of my uh, budget went. And that also factored into the reason why I did it neighborhood based, because I figured if people had less than a mile to walk to participate, they were much more likely to actually come along. And I think that worked out because we had very few people um, put out. So that's what, that was the way I set them up um, in terms of recruitment. In terms of, how I set, in terms of how I set them up, in terms of uh, the moderating, um, it was it was a real learning curve because until you do it, you just have no idea how it's going to go. And you kind of have to do it off the cuff a little bit. When I was preparing for them, I did like a couple of sort of like practice interviews and practice groups, which is always a good thing to do. Um, and talking to like my PhD colleagues around the offices and like, you know, sharing my fears and hopes or whatever about how they were going to go. One of the things that came out is how on earth are you going to get um, eight strangers to talk about not only just politics, but like the politics of like fiscal deficits or whatever. Um, how are you going to get people to talk about that for like an hour and a half or two hours? Um, so that made me very nervous. Um, in the end, to cut to the end, that was no problem at all. If anything, I couldn't get people to stop talking. Uh, so there was a couple of groups that went over two hours. And in the end, I had to kind of be like, we actually have to finish now, even though uh, the things people were saying were, were really interesting. And I think the 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 reason why that happened is because um, when it comes to this kind of interviewing I think what's useful is to have a, a kind of like funnel method so that is you kind of almost the way I ended up thinking about it is you kind of have to sacrifice almost like the first half an hour or for even 45 minutes just to building bonds between the different participants because it's not difficult to put ourselves in the position of a participant isn't it in this focus groups are a very strange contrived uh, form of interaction from a social perspective like you're going in this case you're going to like a community center or a library or, a, or something like that sitting in a room with strangers and just being expected to talk about politics so what i did for the first 45 minutes is i just focused on building rapport and connection between the participants and myself so I kind of just asked questions that I wasn't even necessarily that interested in as a researcher, but obviously um, it was not like I feigned interest, I was interested in what they had to say, but it wasn't um, what I was looking for in terms of data collection. So I asked things that I knew that everyone would be able to answer and that everyone would feel comfortable answering, especially because one of the things I expected is, you know, I'm talking about highly contestable political topics. One of the things I was worried about is that people might start arguing or get annoyed or, or, or whatever might happen. Uh, so the kinds of questions I asked first up were questions like, I know, so what's it like to live in this neighbourhood? Um, what would you change about the neighbourhood? Like, when did you first move here? And things like that, that everyone, the things that everyone has, has something to comment upon. Um, and I think that once you talk about that for like half an hour, it, it, I then, I can't remember exactly how I did it, but it, it, it was relatively naturalistic to, or natural to then move on to like more kind of 
the questions I was really interested in from a research perspective about, in my case, the politics of fiscal deficits and 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 whatnot. But even that, even then, I kind of like funneled them, so I started with easy questions and, and moved on. And in the end, what I found is that what I wanted my moderation I wanted my moderation to be as non-interventionist as possible. I thought that the ideal moderation would be like an ideal seminar that you have with students, which I always think the best seminar would be one where you don't have to say anything, uh, where you just go in and there's just an interesting question. Everyone just talks organically for like an hour and then that's it. Um, that was kind of my approach to the focus groups as well. I thought that if, if I could just give them the topic and just let everyone talk uh, without any direction, that would be like the best form of data, I thought, in terms of, again, going back to some of the, those sort of methodological principles that I was trying to outline. Um, so in the end, if the actual like politics discussion went on for an hour, hour and a half, I probably only asked about four or five questions in that time um, because the discussion, people were just very happy, very happy to, to discuss things. In the second project I did that I mentioned, the moderator was very, very hands on um, and made lots of interventions all the time, uh, which really, which, which is just a different way of doing it, but really, um, uh, I guess rubbed up with the kind of assumptions that I had where you just want people to talk and let people talk freely and not intervene whereas the moderator in that project was very interventionary so would call on people to say things would um, take something that someone said and then put it back to everyone um, and so the data ended up being very very different and the kind of claims we had made from it had to be different because obviously it was being driven considerably by the by the moderator which made complete sense in the context of that project because it was about political messaging. So, um, so yeah, I, I, hope, I hope that that answers some of the questions about the setup and the, and the moderating. But I could, yeah, I could say a lot more on it. So, let me know if you've got any follow-ups on in, on any of that. All right, great. Thank you for that. Um, I mean, unless Volk only gets a help a follow-up, or we can do it later. Okay, uh, Stephen. Then, and then I have also a question in the chat room from uh, Jan Eric, but I think. Um, Stephen was first. Yeah, um, thanks for the presentation. I was quite excited to attend this session because during my master's, which I did at um, Strathclyde in Glasgow, in the Quality Methods course, we actually read your 2014 article. Um, we reaped what we sold. Um, and we did an analysis of this from like a methodological viewpoint. And I had so many questions at this time, which actually you've kind of answered just now. But at the time, I didn't really find them in the article on sampling, for example. Having said that, um, I actually pulled up the article just to kind of remind myself. And I remember um, I looked at the, the appendix of the article, right? And then I was struck by something you said during your presentation just now, <clears throat> which was about the unit of analysis being social and the collective. And then I look at the appendix and I see that in three of the focus groups, there were only three participants. So my question is, how much of a collective is that? And is there like a minimum number? I think elsewhere in the literature, sometimes they say you need like eight, 10 or 12 people in a focus group. So is there some point, like if two people had arrived, would you just say, okay, it's not worth um, pursuing this because I'm not gonna get what I want out of it. Um, also from a quick look at the names and some of them are, um, it's a bit unclear, but it seems like from a rough count that are 13 male and then 23 female. So was this, deliberate or was this just because people didn't show up or like was there a strategy behind it or is this just um, how it happened and then the final question was on your choice of neighborhoods because also the first time I read this I thought maybe it was just for um, like resources financial reasons that you did them all in the West Midlands because I thought well I had concerns about like whether this was representative of the, the population of the UK so what was your strategy for choosing the neighborhoods? Like, was there a theoretical strategy behind it? Or was it just, I live close to here, so I do it here? Thanks. Yeah, great, great question. So superb, thank you. Um, so on the question of, of how small, yes, um, you're right. Some of the groups I did, I think, I, I can't actually remember, but as you say, well, at least one of the groups only had three, had three people in. 
Um, and that was, I think in that, a couple of, I think there's a couple of things. One is that um, I always recruited a minimum of five and sometimes people didn't turn up. Um, and so in that situation, I just went ahead anyway, um, since everyone was there and since I was gonna have to pay them anyway. I think, as you say, like how small would it have to get before you just stop? And two would two would be the number, I guess, like practically, because you just couldn't do it. I think thinking back, what I, my approach was that um, I wasn't very happy about doing it with with three people, or three participants, and I was aware that that might generate slightly different data from the groups with with more people, and and that was a worry. In the end, it was kind of a combination of practical factors and also just how it worked. So how it worked is that, at least in my experience of it and looking at the data and the kind of things I found from it, I didn't find there to be a massive difference in terms of what people were saying or how they were responding to the questions. Um, so I kind of, in that sense, I felt comfortable using, still using that data. Um, I think the practical side is that um, my resources were so limited that in a way, I'm glad that worked out because I actually didn't have, I didn't have, if that if those groups hadn't worked out, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been able to replace them basically. Um, so it's kind of a combination of, it just kind of worked in a way that felt right to me and that I felt I could defend. Um, but also it was, there was a practical aspect of it. And I guess that's gonna be a, probably my answer to all these three questions actually. Um, so in terms of the, the, the male, female, um, the male, female thing, and ensuring that there's a there's a there's a balance there it's tricky what I, what i tried to do is i tried to it goes back to what i was saying about the um sampling so it's you can't have what you can't do is you can't in focus group research you can't say so if someone in a focus group says one thing and someone says another thing you can't then say this person is saying this because they are this particular gender or or whatever but because I wasn't making any, because theoretically I didn't make any distinction between kind of like male and female, like I wasn't like, oh, I want to, the kind of collective that I wanted to analyze was is like male voters or female voters. I was kind of conscious that there has to be, it, overall, there has to be some sort of balance there because otherwise I think there would be legitimate um, methodological questions to raise about that. So I, I, I I wish I could say I had a really systematic approach to, to this, but the truth is that I didn't. I just tried to make sure that broadly speaking across the whole project, there was some balance that would mean that I could meaningfully say that um, both male and female participants were, uh, were involved and that I could scale up in, in, in that sense. On the, on the question of um, choice of neighborhoods, um, yes, the, the reason, the only reason why I picked the West Midlands is because that's where I was doing my PhD. And um, I think being, um, being part of the local area was really helpful because going into different areas, I think would, that I didn't know very well would have been much more, would have um, brought up its own difficulties. I feel once I did the research, I felt confident that the kinds of things that people were saying in Birmingham, that I couldn't think of any logical reason why the way in which people in Birmingham respond to, um, you know, the story of austerity would be fundamentally different from people in other parts of the country. Um, which may sound like an obvious which may sound like an obvious thing to say, but it's not because there may have been like a local political controversy, for example, in one of those neighborhoods or in Birmingham that meant that people in Birmingham were particularly sensitive to, to that. So for example, if you think of like, if, you, if the equivalent, again, from British politics was say Thatcherism and my site was Liverpool, then that would cause problems because Liverpool and Thatcherism have a long and difficult history that, that affects the way in which people interact with that. In my case, I was confident that in the spread of neighbourhoods and the overall locale of the West Midlands and Birmingham, that there wasn't any reason why, I couldn't think of any reason why people would interpret those issues differently. And so again, it goes back to, um, again, a terminology that I really like, uh, which is like, it just requires like a kind of leap of faith, a leap of faith on my behalf to kind of 
show that in my especially in my PhD thesis and my viva that I think that there's no reason why to think that and to some extent on 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 the reader's behalf as well to take a leap of faith that that um that it would be consistent across other other locales and again it just that's the I think that's just part of the challenge and the weakness of of qualitative research I think okay great um Steven, uh, do you want to come back uh, on any of this or? Um, no, I think you answered, uh, Liam, you answered the questions fully. Just the comment about the male-female balance makes me think of the Schwabian housewife in Germany and whether you would find a difference between um, male and female. But that's another debate, I think. Um, right. So, I mean, we have uh, one question here in the chat. Um, a person is asking, uh, I would like to ask whether you already implemented online focus groups or whether you uh, is esteem is feasible with increasing online communication tools. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I can't I can't see the chat directly, by the way, but I, I picked it up from 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 what you said about um, yeah, what, how feasible online groups are. So yeah, it's a really good and interesting question. What if so this second project that I mentioned at the beginning, um, so we started this is well, long story short is that some of the groups we did that for, for that project were online because of lockdown. And uh, so I can say a little bit about that. So the we started the field work for that in um, obviously the best possible timing in December 2019 and it went on until so it was between December 2019 and June 2020. Um, so uh i think we did the first half of it we did before lockdown in the uk came into force so we're still obviously able to meet face to face and and everything like that um and we decided that yeah lockdown probably wasn't going to end anytime soon and that we'd be better off um doing the rest of the research using online groups rather than face to face and um so as I said, we were working with, we were, so it's a collaboration between um, myself, this campaigning group, but also a sort of like professional research um, agency who were taking charge of the actual delivery of the research on behalf of the, of the campaigners. And so their experience, from their experience, they thought that doing kind of, their experience was doing, I guess, like an equivalent of like a Zoom focus group I guess like something a bit like we've got now um they in their experience it was very ineffective to do that because um understandably i guess it's probably many of the issues that i'm sure some of us have faced with online teaching is that getting like participation is quite can be really really challenging and so they the approach that they wanted to adopt that we were happy to do on the basis of that was to instead use um text-based um, discussion rather than I guess like verbal and and visual um, so in effect what we had was close to, to those who remember the old days of the internet is closer to kind of almost like a chat room uh, transcript rather than an actual an actual focus group and that's really that was a really interesting experience to be part of because it it was on the one hand not as I, I wasn't, I guess I wasn't that enthusiastic about the prospects of it because of a lot of the things I said about why I think focus groups are a good and useful method. I couldn't quite see how they would translate into a kind of chat or text-based thing. And to some extent that was correct. So the depth of the discussions in these um, text ones was a lot weaker than the face-to-face -face ones. So the richness of the data was, a lot, was not quite there. Um, because the way in which I use the data, I guess I haven't really said about what I really do with the data, perhaps I'll just say a bit about that. My kind of approach to um, analysing the focus group data is um, what I call it in the article is, is kind of like a form of ideal typification or ideal type. So rather than, and I think a lot of people find this very, um, a lot of other researchers wouldn't feel comfortable doing this, but I guess for some reason I felt comfortable doing it. Is I kind of try to impose order and meaning upon the data that's there. 
um, rather than playing up the difference. Um, I think that's, again, that's not necessarily like the qualitative impulse um, when it comes to this, but that's just what I was interested in. So what I was interested in is kind of like piecing together, looking, so I kind of think of it as, um, as kind of maybe like, I don't know, like peeling back an onion <laughs> to, this is probably not a very good metaphor. Um, we should say that in any conversation at any point in which some sort of collective meaning is being generated, which is probably most conversations, if you think about it, there's going to be a whole series of assumptions, sort of like temporal narratives, identities that have to be in, that have to be there and have to be negotiated in order to, to have the foundation for even a conversation, or even the most basic sort, really. I guess my method, my method for the data analysis was based upon saying that at some point you can strip back the con like different opinions and different ways in which people are taking that at some point you will reach a point where there is something that is consistently shared across all of those all of those discussions even if it's quite basic so that's the bit that i find interesting like the bit that really holds it all together so my method when it comes to the focus groups i've analyzed is to try and strip it back to that point where you get to a consistency of some sort of shared identity or shared assumptions that's underpinning the conversation and use that as the basis for an hour of, of analysis. So the text-based ones were not very effective for that. Um, and if our project had just been the text-based ones, um, I think it would have been very difficult. I would have had to basically develop like a different method for, for analyzing them because that's not possible. As it is in this particular case with the text-based ones, it's actually worked out quite well because we were, we were doing, in the second project, we were doing different, lo different locations across the UK. Um, and the idea was we were gonna do uh, two focus groups in each one. So the way it's worked out just by complete coincidence was the pattern of lockdown, is it meant that for most of the locations we have one face-to-face um, -face group and then one in-tech group. And the in-tech group is after lockdown, so with COVID and obviously that poses lot, that posed lots of interesting extra questions for us that we didn't anticipate about, you know, funding uh, the healthcare service and, and, and whatnot. So in the end, it, it's worked out quite well because the text ones are almost like a comparison point to the, to, the, um, to the group ones. So the way we used them was to kind of like push people on some of the, some of the things that came up in the first ones, we returned to and pushed them on it. These were different participants, I should say, uh, but returned to some of those points and kind of put them to them. And what you get in the text-based ones that you don't get in face-to-face -face ones is you get everyone responding. Uh, so again, one of the weaknesses of focus groups is making sure that everyone participates equally and how much one wants to intervene to ensure that equality. Again, a bit like a, a bit like a seminar. Um, whereas in the text-based ones, everyone was just happy just to type away and say stuff. So it's very useful of something that you thought, something that you might intuitively think, oh, you know, that seemed to be like quite an important point in, in those first focus groups. You could return to and people would say, you know, the sort of some examples that were quite helpful to then writing it up where we'd say someone would say something like I don't know, to do with wealth taxes and then everyone would come in and just say yes 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 which is which proved to be quite useful in terms of just an extra bit of I guess like evidence and to support the claims we we're making but as in general I, th I think I would find it very difficult to to use online focus groups instead of instead of face to face, and obviously that poses lots of challenges for how we conduct how we conduct research at the at the moment. Okay, great. Uh, thanks for that. Um, is there are there any other questions from anyone? Because if if not, I have I have a couple as well myself. Um, yeah, maybe I'll just go with that. I mean, I'm just. I'm still, you know, I kind of want to go back to the kind of the epistemological um, underpinning uh, of, 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 of focus groups. I'm still trying to kind of make sense of, of you know, of the article, what you said, and, 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 and what, of, the, of the article and what you said in your presentation. And, you know, I mean, I, I, mean, I really like the, the, the metaphor that is being used uh, by, I don't remember, Kfale, I think is the author, um, the, the minor and traveler approaches, you know. So that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's really that's, that's super interesting a helpful way of, 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 of thinking of it but I'm still thinking like how to you know about this the, the, the issue of scaling up the results and so because I because I'm just I guess I'm just still confused because I always felt like okay focus groups are actually are being used to like generalize about society 
I mean, if you sample it well, if you sample the fo focus groups well, then you know that, that that's how marketing research is being conducted. No, and that was in the you know in in, in the Bryman uh, uh, um, uh, piece chapter that we that we read for today was was, was also ni nicely described. And also, I mean, in, in political research as well. I mean, we know. That, for example, during Bre during Brexit campaign, Do Dominic Cummings. I mean, that was that was, that was his 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 famous method. His, his one of his favorite methods, no, doing um, focus groups. So, yeah. So I'm so so I'm still confused about this. Like you know what you just said that you, we can't really generalize from fo focus groups or scale up. And one thing, and then the second thing, I guess building on 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 the Cummings example I just brought up. Uh, you know, I know that also he was using focus groups in conjunction with statistical data. So the, my question will be like how we can actually use focus groups in conjunction or in support of quantitative um, methodologies. Yeah, that's that's a great question, and it's it's nice actually to have the chance to kind of clarify some of the things I was saying um, because I might have rushed rushed through some of it actually on the basis of what you say. So yeah, it's not yeah. Perhaps I can clarify what I can say. Um, focus groups have to scale up to some degree because otherwise the method is kind of almost, well, could be potentially quite pointless because it's what are you are trying to say about something. What I meant more specifically is that one cannot use the principles of like generalization as we typically understand it to do that scaling up because in that case it will, it, like if you think about the process of like building like a, po a statistically representative population for us, um, not a population for a survey, but you know what I mean? If you're building a sample for a, for population and all the kind of like the process you have to go through not just technically but kind of like philosophically and as you say epistemologically that just cannot apply to focus groups i don't think because it just doesn't it, in, in a way that i could explain i think if, if i had a bit more time in thinking but it just doesn't make sense it doesn't work practically because you can't there's only 40 people so it's like how can you have so you know in my research there's 40 people so just say there's one just say there's one characteristic that it's like one twentieth of the population. You're then expecting like two people to basically be like the voice of those people in a way that just is completely problematic, on all sorts of on all sorts of ways. So yeah, it's about so just say it's about uh, coming up with a different way to to scale up because you one must scale up. Um, and as I said, I think one of the one of the problems of focus groups in in the literature that I've come across. It's not a big problem, but it's just something that kind of like grinds my gears in a small way is when um, kind of pretend that there is no scaling up, um, that there is no, that it's almost like a cop out. So it's very common in folks group applications where it's, the authors will say, and by the way, we're not making any claims beyond the people we've interviewed. And it's like, you you are, it's like, it will be in the title, it will be whatever it will, because it won't be like focus group, this focus group, um, this focus group study into what 40 people in Birmingham think it will be this focus group study into what Britain thinks or whatever it may be. So we've got to be honest and, and clear about how we're scaling up. And so, yeah, I, that, that's kind of what I meant by that. I think the, the thinking about how other, how non-social scientists use that process is really interesting. So you use the the examples of market research and of Dominic Cummings and both of them are really interesting. So if you think about market research, you can think of the logic of scaling up is still there because again, they're, they're not making rigorous peer reviewed claims of scaling up, but they're still making claims to scaling up in terms of how they report those findings to whoever they're being commissioned by. And in that case, it's not difficult to see how if your um, market research is underpinned by a particular epistemology, isn't it typically, um, at least as I understand it, which tends to be related to a kind of like behavioral economics -y type of type of theory of human action and human behavior and it's not difficult to see how from that basis if we're just talking about how people kind of interact with like a um with a product it's not difficult to see how one can scale up from that in a way that is much easier when you take kind of like politics <laughs> out of it. Um, because once you introduce politics and you're talking about political opinions, it's much more complicated, I think, than talking about how people relate to relate to a product. Um, so that's what that's one thing that's slightly different, I think. And um, the Cummings example is really interesting as well. Um, I guess um, 
again, I, I don't know, this sounds, I'm already thinking about what I'm going to say. It sounds so stupid and obvious that I almost don't want to say it, but I'm going to say it, which is that the main difference between what Dalton Cummings is doing and what, you know, social scientists are doing is that Dominic Cummings, like, we, so he wrote this famous blog post that's been going around today, actually, because there's been some big election results in, in the UK. And, you know, he just says that, oh, when I did some focus groups, this is what I found. And it's like, there's no, obviously, there's no report of them. There's no, um, it's not clear, like, how he did them. It's not transparent or rigorous. It's just like, he did it. And that, that informed his experience and his views of things. Um, and again, this sounds so stupid, but it's obvious that, um, you know, he would struggle to pass that peer review <laughs> with, with his kind of research. So it works for him and um, that's good. And it works in market research. And again, this, I think this comes back to what the conundrum of kind of focus groups and to some extent qualitative research is, is that we can all do that kind of, to some extent we can do that research and we do do research. Well, we don't do research, but we, the way we live our lives in some ways is quite similar to the logic of qualitative research in, in the sense that we all have experiences in the world that we then extrapolate from. So, you know, we'll go to a particular country and we'll say, oh, that, that particular country is like this because of that experience. Um, the conundrum of a lot of qualitative work and focus groups in particular is how do we do that and how do we get those insights that are so, um, that are so relevant and so good as evidenced by Cummings and the way he's able to, to kind of use British political um, opinion to his advantage. Like how do we do that in a way that is rigorous and transparent and that, and that you know, we can publish and, 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 and whatnot? That's the ultimate challenge, I think. So yeah, Rudy, yeah, great set of questions, thank you. And um, yeah, no, sorry, Bob Gong, uh, if you don't mind, I'll just follow up. I mean, it's, yeah, I just find it fascinating because, because yeah, obviously, I mean, it seems like, you know, um, it seems like the, the, the use of focus groups and scaling up worked for Dominic Cummings, you know, um, or I don't know, maybe this is just the, the you know, the, 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 the compelling story that he's, that he sold us and we all believe, but I mean, it seems, it, it seems to have worked. I mean, they, they won. Uh, his campaign won, but then at the same time, you know, in the in the Bryman uh, article, there's this reminder of the of the famous Coca-Cola fiasco when they used uh, focus groups to 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 introduce the new Coke, and they realized that oh my God, like we need to change the change the taste of of, of Coca-Cola in order to sell more. So I mean, I guess yeah, there's a, two examples show that we need to be careful with focus groups, I guess. No. Um, Wolfgang or oh, Liam, do you want to come up with that? Uh I was just gonna say, yeah, I just think that's a that's a great example. And again, well, I mean, we could go into it if we wanted to, but there's there's something that's so interesting about again the difference between the coming study, the kind of coming study, if call it that, and the and that kind of Coca Cola style study, because it's like what they're again, there's something that's so different about what Cummings is doing is where he's just the way he talks about his focus groups is he just says he just kind of sits back and lets people talk and direct it from there. And again, it's interesting to think how that's very different if you're sitting in front of someone with two things and you're forced and you're kind of giving them to um, encouraging them to make a forced choice that is like devoid of like the wider context, which I'm sure, it, which I can't remember from the Brahmin, but I'm sure, sure it was. But yeah, that's, that's so interesting. Um, Wolfgang and then uh, Leonard. Yeah. Um... I basically, my I would have like a follow-up question. On, I mean, we didn't talk a lot about like the actual data collection, maybe in the focus group. And I, I in from what you now said, I, I guess most hints towards like basically just gathering the text and then transcribing the text and um, yeah, uh, analyzing it. But I was just wondering because you talk about intersubjectivity, intersubjectivity and basically meaning making as, as actually what you want to get it. And then I, it kind of struck me that probably in a focus group, there are so many other things which you could observe in terms of like participant interaction or, um, I mean, you could uh, probably you could film that as well, but as I mean, just like who talks to whom, um, or it's, I don't know, like those kind of other streams of data, maybe other than just spoken word. And to what extent did you maybe bring that in or at least are aware of other forms of, 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 of analyzing and, and gathering such forms of data? Yeah, what a superb question. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, so 
Yeah, I think you've had to answer. I think, well, I can, in, in my original project that I did, I guess the short answer is that I didn't, I didn't really incorporate those kinds of things. And to some extent, that's because, again, it's just difficult to explain these things in hindsight sometimes, but I just don't think I was particularly, I, I don't think I was as attuned to those things as I should have been when I was conducting the research for whatever reason. As you, as you rightly picked up upon, I really treated, I treated it as like a text, basically. And so even though I was very interested in the interactive element, I kind of reduced that interactive element to the text. So the way in which people built upon each other in, in the actual conversation. And I don't think in hindsight, I did nearly enough to think about the, as you said, the actual social situation of the focus group. I think it's only in hindsight that I see it like that. Um, as you know, because you could, looking back, I can even, I can sort of even like pitch and remember, like, as you say, like the way in which particular participants would really bounce off each other and perhaps some participants would then feel slightly um, less comfortable participating because they felt that they were like you know outside this kind of like implicit alliance that, that, that starts stuff and kind of see that in hindsight I think um, there's a couple of things to say about that about how I feel about that and looking back in hindsight one is that in a way it was probably quite it was probably quite good that I didn't wasn't attuned to that because I think I would have ended up I think I would have ended up analysing the data in a very different way that would have given me, that I would have focused on in a different way and would have written it up in a different way and might have even got to slightly different, different. it's possible that I would have got to different results. And that, because the, the danger and risk of that kind of thinking, at least for the method that I was interested in doing and the questions that I was, answered, I was interested in, is that if you focus too much on the interaction, the argument and the analysis can become about the interactions rather than the big questions I was actually interested in, which is how people are relating to this story or this narrative. Um, and I think that's something that I, because I did my master's in an anthropology department. Um, so I was quite with lots of people who were very meta. And so I had to read a lot of articles where it was about, um, you know, uh, I mean, I could give examples, I won't throw it. So I was kind of, I, I didn't want to get too meta in terms of the participation and engagement. And so I think it's partly, I didn't see it, partly also I took like almost like a, a position of strategic ignorance where I was like, I'm just going to treat it as a text. That's all I'm going to do. Um, and in a way, I'm happy I did that. But in another way, I think it would have been, it would have been more rigorous to really say more and incorporate the interaction between different participants more because I'm sure it, I mean it goes without saying like any social situation that's going to affect what people say and and how they do it so I kind of have conflicting slightly conflicting views upon it um, and again I think this kind of research is full of those kind of trade-offs where it's kind of impossible to it's impossible to kind of tick tick every box if that's the right way of putting it and those are the boxes that I decided to tick I think Okay, great. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's all about a kind of, I guess, setting up, um, setting out to be either a miner or traveler, or or or, or both. No, and then it's just depending what you want. So it's finding the balance between those two things, I guess. No, um, Leonard, you have a question as well. Um, yeah, thanks. It's more like uh, <clears throat> some collections of thoughts that I had. Uh, first, I thank you very much. I found it a very interesting discussion here. Uh, I had a thought when uh, Marius uh, brought in these focus groups that are used in marketing or, or political campaigning, uh, because maybe there's a different mechanism there also at play, because to my understanding, you it's not necessarily that you have a representative sample, for example, in these focus groups. It's important that you have a sample of the target group you want to reach, right? So if a party recruits a focus group, for example, out of its own members or something, that is exactly what you, what you want then. And then the other thing is that... Um, uh, that uh, I always understood these focus groups also some form of like nearly as an experimental setting where you try to give some uh, something into the group and see how the group you know develops something out of the group uh, for example um, in the same way like these citizen assemblies that you also sometimes see which I think is you could also interpret as a focus group but the idea is not that you somehow understand what these people think about something but that these people actually develop something as a, as a group um, and I don't know, maybe you have some, some thoughts about that, because indeed, I don't know, it's, is it something different than these focus groups that you are doing when you're saying you try to develop some qualitative form of public opinion or, or how does it interplay? 
Yeah, see, superb questions. Thank you. Yeah, so interesting. I think, um, yeah, I think on that question, what do I think? So I think that, um, Sorry, Leonard, could, could you just, uh, my mind's just gone blank. Could you just repeat the question? Yeah, I think that my main point is that there's there's some form of like understanding of a focus group. And um, maybe when I understand, when I hear you say you uh, your focus group are developed as some form of response to public opinion as a qualitative concept or positivist concept, um, but you nevertheless want to somehow get some, how people relate to concepts, as you said just a few minutes ago, out of focus group. But I, I do think that focus groups, for example, in marketing or in this public uh, uh, political campaigning, or also the citizen assemblies, uh, I don't know, I understand it some, even as an experimental setting where you try to test how the group, how the social form of a group uh, reacts to some, some, some treatment, basically, and how this, uh, yeah, how this interacts or how this interplays with your conception of focus groups. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, thanks for repeating the question. It's my bad. Um, uh, yeah, that, that's that's a super episode question. So I think on so to, to put slightly to put a twist in your question. So I'm going to twist it into something slightly different, uh, which is you know to what extent can we can we kind of like use sort of experimental conditioning in focus groups? Because I think one one of the things that's I don't, one of the things that's quite interesting is obviously um, experimental methods especially kind of like survey embedded experiments and lab experiments have been like a big a big kind of thing in political and in political science and international relations over the last decade or so and one of the things that um, I always find quite kind of like I guess funny talking to people who are involved in market research such as the group such as the groups who helped us in the second project is that um, for them that kind of logic is just as you say it's like completely intuitive <laughs> so they'll say things like oh yeah we're thinking so for example they they have a term in marketing called like A-B testing, which um, I'm not sure if you've come across, but as simple as like you have two groups, one called A, one that's called B, and you give them like different messaging and see how they respond. And to them, that's like the most obvious, simple thing you could ever do. And obviously uh, in a political science context, that's like, wow, that's like doing big things. That's like doing um, an experiment, uh, which, which sounds really kind of um, fancy and, and whatnot. So yeah, there's, uh, I've been curious about the capacity to introduce that kind of thing for for a while. I didn't do it in my I didn't do it in my original research because I don't think I had the foresight. And even if I did, I think I would have been a bit too nervous to try it. Um, because again, once you start, once you introduce something like that, it's a bit like the interaction thing. It it I think it has a tendency to then uh, uh, sort of like overtake the whole project. Um, and in a way, it then becomes difficult to make any claims without referring back to this, this element that has been introduced. In the second project that I did, that I mentioned, that we did during lockdown, we did do some what could be called experimental messaging, but no, no one in the project called it that because they're coming from a more kind of like marketing and campaigning perspective. So we did things like we gave participants like different potential political messaging over like wealth taxes, for example. And we saw how people reacted to that. And that from a kind of like political campaigning uh, perspective was absolutely fascinating because it was clear that some messages which within it contained a whole series of assumptions and like a sort of like vision for the political vision for the country, uh, people consist, there's like a couple of messages that people found, that participants found to be completely, I don't know, incredulous, offensive even. Um, which in this case happened to relate to things like wealth, um, taxing wealth, um, which people saw as like um, almost an attack or a threat to their own livelihoods in terms of like having a pension and, and buying a home, uh, which obviously is not the political intention behind these um, campaign groups. But, anyway. um, but having now writing that up as a social science project, I, f I haven't, I haven't incorporated that material because I just find it, I just don't, I don't feel like I have, um, I guess the kind of basis, the methodological basis to know what claims I can actually make from that. 
even though they make intuitive, it goes back to what Dominic Cummings thinks, like it, it makes completely intuitive sense. But when it really comes down to it and you start dividing up already a very small group into different groups and you're saying, well, these people then, it starts becoming like, well, I'm not actually sure what, what kind of like solid, justifiable social science claims can I actually make from this? I find that quite difficult. Um, I think what probably what I would need to do and what other people would need to do if they thought about doing this is build it into the foundation of the project and the kind of the things we're doing, which we didn't do in this case, because as I said, it was a slightly unusual project in the fact that it was half campaign led, half social science led. But I think it's, there's so much potential there for doing interesting stuff. Um, to, and I'd love to, I'd love to give that a go at, at some point for sure. Cool. Um, Leonard, do you want to go back to that? Or uh, anybody has any more questions? Because um, I have, I have, or maybe, maybe that could potentially be the last question. I mean, I guess a couple of more uh, practical questions, I guess, to you, Liam. I was wondering about, um, you, you, can, you kind of hinted on it and mentioned it during, the, during your talk, uh, basically about like, how do you direct conversation in, in, with, with, during the focus group to kind of, you know, not to well waste time on talking on something on something that is not relevant to the to the, to the, to the project and two how do you actually transcribe group, focus groups um, so basically I'm, I'm i'm looking for some like you know uh, best codes on uh, or, or practice for both of those things from you yeah no great questions so in terms of directing the conversation yes good question um the way the approach I took during my doctoral research was, as I said, I wanted my I wanted my role to be as limited as possible. Uh, that was kind of my background assumption that if I could say as little as possible, that would be good. But of course, there were times where I had to kind of where I had to step in and redirect the conversation. But I tried to do that as little as possible. I kind of my logic was, I guess there was a kind of like sort of crude cost benefit analysis where I was so aware of the challenge of just getting people to speak and of like interacting with one another that I kind of thought that if people look, I guess I had some sort of implicit cost benefit where it's like how much am I willing to give up people talking about things that aren't directly relevant but that will build their rapport and confidence and confidence and and stuff that will then hopefully pay dividends later so it was always a quite difficult balance to get and I think there were a couple of times where I, I had to kind of you know gently Okay. It, it, my experience it really was quite similar to running like a seminar discussion like with students where it's like you know you just have to kind of find a way of like intervening and saying oh that's really interesting um i just wanted to know what everyone thinks about like this particular thing and sort of directing it gently gently that way what i had is i had i think i had like two or three questions that i considered to be absolutely essential to what i was doing that I thought if I didn't ask these questions, then to some extent like, it's not working. So I always just made sure that as soon as, as long as those questions were answered, which were directly relevant to my research questions, I was kind of happy to there for there to be a bit of, I guess, like randomness or 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 whatnot. Um, but as I said, in the second project, the moderator was very direct, and there probably wasn't longer than a minute at any one point about the moderator intervening to kind of say, oh, what do you think about that? Or let's move on to this, um, uh, which I found very, yeah, very different to the kind of the logic that was that was underpinned by that first project. Um, in terms of the second question about transcription, as I, as I said, the um, I think it's from uh, Wolfgang's question earlier about treating the data as like a text and and not looking so much at the kind of social interaction aspect even though that was even though that is theoretically important and so that kind of that i guess that kind of played into the transcripts so the way we transcribe the way i transcribed it was i just did it um verbatim as possible with every single um with every single kind of utterance or kind of vocal sound kind of included so some of it ended up being obviously quite staccato because that's the way people speak the real difficulty comes when people speak over one another and that's really difficult to convey in a in a transcript um in 
in those cases, if if you can't if you can't actually decipher the voices, you just have to note people talking over one another. And if and if um, but normally, even with those, when people are speaking over one another, it's kind of possible to identify a kind of like order to it. So it would, it would be very unusual that two people would start speaking exactly at the same time. And in that case, in the transcript, I would I would um, reflect that by the first person who speaks speaking, and I would say put a, put some sort of code in to say that um, the next person speaking is still is speaking or over the over the first person, which again could have been important, but I didn't incorporate massively into the way I analyze the data, um, even though I think there would be a case as, as Wolfgang raised for kind of, you know, there is a politics to kind of like interrupting and, and speaking that could be quite important. But I kind of made a kind of decision not to incorporate that fully into it because I just felt that that would take up so much time and take attention away from the things I was interested in. Whether or not that's the right or wrong decision is kind of difficult to say, but it's what I felt was, was right for me. Yeah, totally. No, I mean, that also just got me thinking of, you know, of whether we should um, video record focus groups, you know, would that help? Would, it, would looking at uh, people's interaction actually on video, would that be, but it all kind of depends. I mean, what do you want to take out of it as you, as you, as you keep saying, you know, it's all, it's all about that, I think. Um, okay. Um, any more, any more questions for anyone? Or maybe is it Wolfgang, yeah? It might not be relevant. It's just like, if uh, I was just wondering whether the interplay or difference between normal like one on one interviews and focus groups and whether you did anything in that regard or where, I mean if you just focus on focus group that might not necessarily apply but I was just wondering yeah to what extent there was if you if you also did like one on one interviews whether there was difference and in what ways kind of um, that comes across um, uh, kind of in that direction. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, for, so I've done I've done kind of one-on-one -on -one interviews before, but I didn't do any one-on-one -on -one interviews for either of these two projects, other than as piloting. Um, so I piloted like the the research, the question routes and the topics and the kind of things I was interested in on like one-on-one -on -one interviews, just to kind of get a sense of how people might respond to them. And I can think back to my first project and the uh, and the questions that worked really well on focus groups did not yeah did not work well in individual questions at all because so if you think back like you know i said i was interested in quite seemingly quite arcane things to do with like politics of fiscal deficits and i found that in my pilots when i interview people one-on-one -on -one about that it was like a bit of a struggle because what i wanted ideally was like kind of a like long i kind of wanted like almost a like narrative form of what people were saying and that's very it's just very difficult one-on-one -on -one when it's about something that's quite disconnected from people's lives such as like, you know, politics and, and whatnot. So I tended, I remember, in, and this is kind of what gave me the heebie-jeebies before I actually started the research properly, because in the in the one-on-one -on -one interviews, I think one of them lasted like 10 minutes. Cause it's like, you just ask, I was asking people about that sort of thing. And because it wasn't, there'd be, um, there, there might be another way to do it. If I was interested in that to kind of relate it to, you know, people's life course and to relate it to their experience in a much more individual way. Um, that was a really interesting experience for me. Um, and so, yeah, it'd be, again, I've been, I've thought about how interesting it would be to, um, to combine the two. So something that I think would be really interesting to do would be to do focus groups like I've done and then go back and interview all the people individually, say like a month or two afterwards, uh, see which could be used as a way of triangulating the kind of findings that one might find from the uh, focus groups in terms of like collective meaning making also be quite interesting from a kind of like quasi experimental perspective as well to see whether especially if you did like a survey beforehand uh, to see whether people have changed their minds about certain things and, and whatnot because again that, that's something where i think focus groups have got a lot of potential for in terms of whether people change their minds on the basis of collective collective discussion but yeah so it's not not something that i've that i've, um, that I've done personally but i think it's very very interesting Yeah, I find it actually super interesting as well. There was there's a, there's a paper I was reading some 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 time ago on on Russian uh, nationalism, and the researcher conducted interviews uh, one on one in person, uh, and then invited all those interviewees into a into a focus group room 
and they just answered completely differently. I mean, everyone suddenly was super patriotic. Everyone was loving the, 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 the party, loving the mother Russia. Whereas in private interviews, everyone was just kind of like disillusioned with, 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 with patriotism or nationalism. And it's just fascinating to see. And um, but with that, with that, you know, I think also it, this comes back to what you said at the beginning as well, uh, which is the problem of time and funds. You know, like once, once for once, like how do you actually get all those people to conduct interviews and then meet them in one room, in one the same room, or um, and how do you make sure that you can actually pay for it? No. Yeah, exactly. It's very, it's very, very tricky. It's. Um... Yeah, it's a real, it's a real conundrum. I think um, lots of people I know have developed clever, so there are clever shortcuts to getting around that. So for example, if you use pre-existing groups, so if you know that there's, so you know, people who go to say, I don't know, church every Sunday or play football together every Thursday, there's ways you can then piggyback on existing group formations to, to get around the resource problem. But of course, once you start introducing extra elements like interviewing people before and after, um that that makes it even more even more even more difficult it is tricky and and by the way that that paper you mentioned about russian nationalism sounds so interesting and i think yeah that gets right at the core of why folk scripts are an interesting method but that's exactly that's like in a way that's the whole point that people the fact that people would say different things in those different settings is in a way the whole point that makes them so uh so useful yes that sounds fascinating Um, yeah, okay, cool. Um, I don't know if there's any more questions or comments, or maybe, I don't know, from you, Liam, something that we should have uh, asked uh, ask for or something that we missed uh, in, part in particular. I don't know. No, I think um, I've really, I mean, from a personal perspective, I've really enjoyed uh, the questions I've got. I think they've all been uh, really incisive, really generous, really interesting to me. Uh, it's really interesting for me to kind of like, think about how I've done this and how I might do it again in the future if I do so. So from a personal perspective, I think it's been it's been really, really um, interesting and useful. I've been really impressed by the questions. I think we've covered pretty much every, you know, covered like the philosophical background, the methodology, the epistemology, the practical sides, everything. So I don't think I've got anything, I've got nothing else that I'd like to kind of like pass on, pass on or share, I don't think. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think that's very true. And I think that's a great wrap up of, of today's session. So thank you so much once again for, for coming and, 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 and taking the time to talk to us, even despite uh, the, 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 the COVID vaccine uh, <laughs> issues. And uh, yeah, and thanks everybody else for, 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 for coming and for the questions. Just uh, for the last time, just a quick reminder, we have the Ethnography Book Club um, starting on Tuesday next week. And in two weeks time, we have another qualify uh, session happening uh, on Zoom still uh, as well. Um, and until then, take care. Thanks very much and uh, see you next time, hopefully.